Welcome back to the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast. Today we have a very special guest, Marion Parsons from Miss Mustard Seed. If you don't follow her, you probably haven't been hanging around at all in the home decor space for the last like 15 years. So most likely you've heard of her, but she is such an inspirational person for all things decorating. I think that her style influences so many people because it's very unique and classic and just so Miss Mustard Seed. When you see something that comes from her, you know it's hers. And I don't feel like there's very many people out there like that. She has a knack for adding character without like ripping her house completely apart. So we're gonna be chatting all about that. Easy ways to add character. We're also gonna be chatting about her new upcoming book, Feels Like Home. So let's dive in. My name is Lisa, mom of six and creator of the blog and YouTube channel, Farmhouse on Boone. Join me as I share with you my love for creating a handmade home from scratch cooking and a little mom and entrepreneur life along the way. I'm doing good. How are you doing? Doing well. I was so excited when your uh, agent reached out to me. She was like explaining, you know, who Marion is and her history. And I'm like, I know who she is. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the topic we talked about is adding character. Um, like when you're overwhelmed and maybe you don't have a historic home. And I love that topic. I've actually done that topic a few times on this podcast, but with different people. And we'd love to hear your perspective on it. I feel like you okay. are so good at it. I mean, you moved from a historic home to a non-historic home, correct? And yeah. so you're you're doing it. You're adding all of the character to a home that, I don't know, maybe didn't have it before. It really, though, it helped me to see your design expertise whenever you started adding character into this home because... In a lot of ways, it's pretty easy whenever a home already has so much to work with. Did you find yeah. it pretty challenging? Yeah. I I mean, I think this home had really good bones, but yes, it. I think you just have to be creative in a new way. Whereas in the last house I was in, it was this 1940s Cape Cod. Right. So it had wood doors and glass knobs and really cute pine trim. And, and it just, it's like, you could kind of paint the room white and just put yeah, some good antiques exactly. in there and call it done, you know, and that was it. Uh -huh. And in here, I've just learned, I have to get a little bit more. I just have to have a little bit more of a vision for adding the character and what's going to be right with my style, but also right for the home. And so that's, that's been the challenge. Yeah. So I'm sure everybody already follows you, but can you briefly tell us about your home that you currently live in? Yeah. So the house we live in, I bought it. Uh, we bought it four years ago. We moved to Minnesota from Pennsylvania. So I had dreams of like, oh, the quaint Minnesota farmhouse. That's, you know, that's what I want. And unfortunately that didn't line up with like where we actually needed right. to live. It would have been like an hour commute for my husband and to get my kids to school. And it just, it just wasn't going to work. So what we ended up in is this, um, at the time it was a 13 year old suburban house, with a two-story foyer, everything was beige and off-white. And it that was kind of what I didn't want. It's like I almost would have rather had a home that was like a major fixer upper. So I could just like rip things out. And yeah. It was too <laughs> too nice already. <laughs> yeah, it was a little too nice and too new to like go in and just right. get it. And so I had to really. I had to respect what the house was, even though it like wasn't what I was looking for as far as the age, it had all of the other things that we wanted and all the things we needed. It was close to school. It was close to my husband's work. It was in this great neighborhood. So which the boys had never had that where they could like ride bikes to the park with their friends and hang out with neighborhood kids. It had all of that. Um, it had room for my business. It had, um, plenty of room for us as a family, for entertaining, for hanging out. It was just perfect for this stage of life. I, it just wasn't old. That was the only yeah, thing. Yeah. That was the only thing. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing is it also had great, a great layout and great bones. It's kind of the layout is, is a very sort of typical four square um, design. 
where you have the central foyer and the staircase, mm-hmm. and then you have four, four main rooms. And so the fact that it had sort of the, this traditional foundation made it like, okay, I, I can work with this. It's not super modern. It does have this, even though it's a newer home, it, it has roots in um, sort of a classic aesthetic. And mm-hmm. so it also had like transom windows above the doors and um, some of there was a hardwood floors in some of the house. And so I was like, okay, I can, I can work, I can work with, with this. this. Yeah. It's just going to take just a lot of cosmetic work, a lot of paint and changing right. out the hardware and changing out the light fixtures. Um, and also adding some architectural detail because right. that there was some like with built-ins and fireplace mantles and some crown molding and trim and stuff like that. But it needed more. A lot of the rooms uh-huh. felt like big boxes. Well, and it's, I've actually had multiple people on this podcast who live in historic homes that have been so renovated that it didn't have character in it either, just because yes. it's old. So I think it's, you know, the age doesn't always tell the whole story of whether or not this home's going to be easy to add the character to it. Yeah, that's you know. true. You do have homes where people have just stripped away all the original yeah, stuff. Yeah, just it, it's- the longer it's been around, the longer people have gotten the idea to, you know, renovate it and make it whatever is currently modern. But one thing I notice with you and your home, I don't know, I think it was probably the same in your old home. You don't seem to do anything like major, like move this wall, open this up. It seems like you more embrace what your home has and then completely enhance it with antiques and paint. Have you, is that something intentional you've done? Yeah, I, I, well, I think first of all, I do try to work with what I have. I think that I'm just, um, maybe I'm better creatively in that way that I kind of, I, I look at what's there and okay, how can I make the best of this? I'm not one who, well, I think it would be fun to do a, a gut job and just totally start from scratch at some point. Um, we just haven't been in that season of life where we yeah. wanted to do it, where we both like both my husband and I are like, yes, let's go for this. Uh, in our last house that we lived in, it was in this little tiny downtown area in in Pennsylvania, this little town called Biglerville, that there was only so much we could do to that house that would make financial sense because right. it was not in this desirable hot location where we would be able to sell it and make a lot of money yeah. off of it. So, so we were, it just did not make sense to do these enormous projects. And in this house, I think there's a lot more potential. The market's really great. We're in Rochester, Minnesota, which is the home of the Mayo Clinic. So there's, it's a really, really great area for investing in your home, but the bones of the home were really good. And while we could have, I mean, there's certainly some things we could have ripped out and stuff, but we just, it it just didn't need that. And I think I try to be really strategic about where I spend my decorating dollars. I think that I want to spend it where it's really going to matter. Um, I think the built-ins on both sides of our fireplace are a really good example. They're, they're yeah. asymmetrical. One side was built. So it's deeper. It has this recess to fit a TV and the other side is kind of designed more like a hutch. And, and I remember so many people, Oh, you should just like rip out one side and do them. So they're both the same. And, and, and it's like, well, I could do that, but these are like really nice solid wood cabinets. Right. And I, I just don't feel like I need to do that to make this room beautiful. I think I can style them. And yeah. If I designed it, would I have designed them symmetrically? Yes. But I'm just going to work with what I have. Cause I'd rather not spend the money to, I mean, we're talking thousands of dollars to get new right. built-ins or to get the wood to build it. And I, we're just not going to do that. We're going to work with what we have and spend that money where we're going to, where it's going to make a greater impact, like right. putting hardwood floors in the living room. So, right. Yeah. Yes. So that's what, what I try to do is 
work with what I have so that I can stretch my decorating dollars further. Right. That's a really good point. So what are some of your favorite low cost ways to add a ton of character? Like when you say, you know, stretch your budget, what are some of the things that you're more excited about spending the money on? I think I have a few ideas, but (laughs) of what you might say. I mean, paint's like the no brainer. Yeah, exactly. But you just always start with paint. Right. I mean, you, you can paint anything you can. I mean, I've painted floors, walls, obviously trim ceilings, um, appliances, cabinetry. Uh, Mm -hmm. I, I paint just about anything, anything and everything. If it'll hold still long enough and paint will stick to it, I will, I'll I'll give it, I'll give it a try. I'll give it a try. Um, but the other thing that I think is is sometimes overlooked is, is molding, Mm -hmm. just trims and molding. Um, Um, I, in this house, like I said, a lot of the rooms were just kind of boxes. So I've added a wainscoting in, in several of the rooms where I'll just put up a chair rail, which if you're like, you've never done trim before chair rail is a great place to start. It's Cause that's just, just like one strip, right? Of, uh, it is, it's one yeah. strip of molding and it's amazing how, I mean, you can get it done probably an average room in less than an hour. Um, Mm -hmm. and probably for around less than $50, depending on the kind of trim that you select. So it's a super easy project and it just adds that just a little bit of character. Now it's traditional. Definitely. It's not going to, if your home is really modern, maybe that's not going to work, but in any kind of home that has a traditional vibe, then a chair rail is a great option. And then what I've done is underneath the chair, chair rail, I did picture frame molding and then painted that out white so that it just looks like this, you know, this wainscoting on the bottom half of the wall. Right. And it just adds this great, um, detail in this room that kind of looked like a box now has this architectural detail and it, it really didn't cost very much and it didn't take much time. Right. And I like the idea of, I heard this on a different podcast, but the room being interesting before you even bring anything into it. So like you're talking about improving the actual box before putting in all of your beautiful, beautiful things. And I think sometimes we forget about that part, you know, and that's what with your moldings and. Well, and I think that's how you can inject character into a home is that's the big difference between old homes and new homes. Although if you're getting into like high end custom homes, then you do have beautiful moldings. And that's one of the things that makes those homes stunning, but also very expensive and not attainable for most people. So when you buy just a typical suburban home, in most cases, the rooms are a box, right? Maybe there's chair rail in like a dining room or something like that, or a formal living room. But in most of the house, you're going to get like little dinky two inch trim, which is Mm -hmm. way out of scale. When you have a room with a really high ceiling, you're going to have like dinky uh, mantles that are just sort of stock mantles that are stuck on. So by beefing up some of those, the molding and the details of the room, it, it just gives you this more interesting foundation. And, and I think I realized that from living in apartments where I couldn't do that kind of thing. And Uh I realized I I was trying to camouflage a boring room with stuff. Right. So it was like this overabundance of stuff that I was throwing at a room. So I think if you realize like, if you're just throwing stuff at the room, then maybe you need to address some things in the room itself first and then let the furnishings be, you know, a bit simpler. And, um, so it's, it's not this, this battle of trying to hide Uh something that you don't like. Yeah. And I don't know if in your area, do you guys have any architectural salvage type of places where they pull things out of old houses and Yeah. So yeah, we do. We had a few things that were added over the years. So they weren't trimmed out properly to match. And so we went and got like the fluted moldings and the rosettes. And it's so cheap if you do that route as well. And I mean, it's not everyone's style to have the more of like the Victorian, you know, but they do have thick, nice things. Like even you could replace doors from going to one of those shops. Yes. 
I, that's one thing I wanted to do in our last house was I wanted to, we had an addition on the house. So there was this disconnect between the 1940s part of the house yes, and the new part. We had that all over the place. Yeah. yeah. And I really wanted to try to make them feel similar. So that was one thing that was like on my list to do, but I never went and did it, but to, yeah. to replace the doors so that they all matched. And we, we don't plan on living in this home forever. We hope some at some point we can move into an older house again or a house with some property. Um, but if we were going to live here, like, you know, this was the last house we were going to going to live in, then I would definitely like replace the hardware on all the doorknobs and make them, you know, look old and just give them give everything a little bit more personality. But again, I'm kind of like we did with the last house. It's like, I want to make the house mine, but I also want to, I don't want to overdo it to the point uh-huh. where it's like, you know, if we know we're not going to live here forever in this specific house, then there's only so much I want to do. Right. So the moldings or some of the, like the wall trim and lots of paint now in your kitchen, did you, I think I remember you painted the cabinets, didn't you? Did you work with what yes. you had there? I thought so. Yeah. And it looks, I mean, that was quite the transformation. I know that we've all heard of painting cabinets, but again, you added a ton of character by adding color, I believe on your Island, a huge yep. pot rack, painting the cabinets. You probably already had nice stuff that you didn't want to take out. Yeah. The cabinets were really nice. There was no reason to not keep right. them. And so I, I knew right away, like, these are getting painted. There's like no doubt. I don't have to like, right. You think don't have about to think it this or over. contemplate. They're <laughs> going to be painted. Um, yeah. and I knew I'd paint them white and, and then I painted the Island kind of a rich grassy green color. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we did the biggest thing that we did was, uh, I really wanted a gas range. I'm used to cooking on gas. I did not want an electric range. And so we did, um, right when we moved in, we went through the trouble of having the gas line run yeah. to the kitchen. So that and that's really a such a range. small thing. Like that's not a huge renovation expense, really, you know, just no, to- it wasn't. I think it was like $300 and, um, they did have to put a hole, a couple of holes in the basement uh-huh. walls. So we that did the was same the thing. thing. I wanted gas yeah. too. And so but I'm like, did, put holes in the wall. That's yeah. Fine. I'll, we'll pass. I love up. I having, just, yeah, it was worth it completely. Same thing. Yes, here. Totally worth it. So that was one of the bigger things we did. And then replacing the countertops was the other big one we okay. had. Um, we, and that was, it was a hard one for me because we had really nice countertops. They were granite. Um, they were, you know, they were upgraded countertops. There was nothing wrong with them. It was just, I did not like them and they did not feel like me. And yes, you can paint countertops. I, I did not want to paint. I would granite. struggle to paint just, granite because it's, yeah. It, were you able to sell it? It's a nice material. I gave it away. I gave it yeah. to people. So who, somebody else can yeah. use it. Yeah. yeah. So I, oh, I, I would hate to paint granite too. That would just wouldn't be right. <laughs> yeah. I just, it, that didn't, that just didn't sit well with me. Um, and you know, we could have kept it, but that was one of those splurges that I was like, this is going to make a huge difference Mm -hmm. in the house, in the kitchen where we spend so much time. And, um, I'm going to, I'm going to get what I really want. So we went ahead and got some quartz counters that are kind of look like a, you know, a white and gray marble. Yeah. That's exactly what we did. I love them one bit. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Worth the money. Definitely. Yeah. Every once in a while you pick something that doesn't have to necessarily make sense, but you've been so mindful in other areas. Now, the biggest thing that I noticed that you use to infuse character everywhere is elbow grease, Mm -hmm. like making slip covers, finding antiques, adding paint. I feel like you spend more of that or you do more of that than spending money. And it shows it's not something that you want that to be just optional. Like maybe if I pay enough, I don't have to, you know, figure out how to sew these custom curtains or whatever, but sometimes you just can't replace good old fashioned elbow grease. Well, it really started out of a desire to have 
something that I saw that I couldn't afford or Mm -hmm. seeing something in a book or a magazine that then I couldn't find in actuality to purchase. Maybe it was an antique or something someone made. And so I actually, I, when I was 21 or 22, I traded my pair of rollerblades with my mom for her sewing machine. She wanted to start oh, nice. roller. She wanted to start rollerblading, <laughs> and, and I wanted to start, to start sewing. sewing. So she gave me this old Kenmore. I think probably from the early eighties, and um, and I learned. I just kind of taught myself to sew on, and I made a lot of really ugly things and things. Oh well, yeah, were, you know, <laughs> me too. At that same age, that was just a disaster. <laughs> but um. But I, I just slowly, like I got books on slip covering and I, you know, just kept making them until I finally got to a point where I felt like, Hey, they're pretty good. And I felt pretty confident in it. And then I started doing upholstery and I would buy, I went to yard sales almost every weekend. And I started buying old wood furniture and then oh, I want to change the color. So I started painting and refinishing furniture and it's, it's become a thing that, um, like, even if I could just go out and buy something, most of the time I want something specific. So mm-hmm. I'd rather find something used and then make it my, you know, and then like reupholster it. So it's has just the fabric I want. The frame is just the finish I want. Right. Um, so it's kind of more about wanting something that's custom, but it does really free up the decorating budget to then, you know, hire someone to do something that maybe it is either beyond my DIY ability or it's something that I don't want to do. Right. Like, like plumbing or electric or yeah, or refinishing floors or like uh-huh. I can lay tile, but I'd rather if I can just hire Not. someone to lay tile, yeah. I just would they have the saw, they have all the expertise. I'd just rather have them do it than. To well, and you'll get myself. the same result if you hire them to do the tile. Whereas like with the things that you've made in your house with the slip covering and some of your embroidery on the slip covers and the upholstery, you can't buy that. Yeah. I, I get people asking me, I know you do too, like, Hey, where can I get a slip cover like that? And I'm like, you can't, it's just not right. available. <laughs> I mean, maybe you can, people are like, well, maybe you would make them for me. I'm like, that's going to be like $5,000. Right. Okay? <laughs> like for me, like that for you. That takes so much time. And, you know, it's just something that you'll treasure forever because it's not replaceable. You cannot, I don't know if you found a place, but yeah, well, and also it's just, it's custom. So it's made for that specific chair. I work, um, when I slip cover, I do pin fitting. So it's like fitting a dress to one specific body. So it's not going to, Uh I can't, it's yes. not something I can replicate. I know. I'm like, I'm going to need again. your chair. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I have to ship that so to me. And I then <laughs> never did go into the slip covering business for that reason. <laughs> well, I don't think anybody would be willing to pay how many hours it takes. You know, it just, it looks easier than it is. I, I know that from experience and I haven't done very many pieces at all, but yeah, yeah. it does but take a lot of work. Can, I remember you saying on one of your videos, like years ago, I admire people who can make dresses. This chair is just sitting still, like just pinned to it, you know? <laughs> yeah. The chair's not going to complain if the dress isn't laying right or, it, yeah. you know, makes, makes their hips look wide, you know? It's, yeah, right. <laughs> I think it's, it's very forgiving. Um, I do think that, and it is funny. I've had people say, oh, they make all these clothes and all this stuff, but they're scared to make a slip cover. I'm like, oh, you've got, you got it. This. You've got yeah. it. You could you can do it. But a great place to start if you want to get into home decor sewing is curtains because mm-hmm. they really, yeah. it really is just one long straight line. And um, it doesn't even have to be perfectly straight, just as long as it's right. relatively straight. Yeah. It, Cause it'll, you're, you're going to be okay. Gather together. And yeah. Yep. 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 That is a really great place to start. And pillows. Yes. Pillows just are so- good too. Yep. And then you can start getting into things like, um, you know, piping and cordage and stuff right. that will kind of give you a little bit more confidence to get into doing something um, like making a slipcover. Also, an ottoman is a really good place to start if you want to make a slipcover because oh, it's yes. 
pretty, you know, they're square rectangle. It's, it can be pretty simple. I'm a big believer in give yourself success in some small things. And then Uh you'll have the confidence to like, don't start with the sectional. It'll just don't start with the section. I don't even know how you do the sectional. (laughs) If it's not like mirror image. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Yes. Or even a chair, like you said, start with an ottoman or even like just a really simple bench. Don't even have to add piping if you don't want to just drape it, fit it, maybe add a ruffle or whatever. And yeah. Yeah. Yes. Start simple, give yourself some success and then, and then move on to something more complicated. And then branch out. Yeah. Let's talk a bit about collections because you're the queen of that. I mean, I've always (laughs) admired all of your collections, how they're displayed. Did you go through a lot of years of buying stuff that didn't look good? Oh, sure. Yeah. (laughs) I, (laughs) well, I think I've always been a collector. First of all, it kind of runs in the family. I, it skipped a generation though. My mom is not a huge collector, (laughs) but my, uh, my Oma, my grandmother on my mom's side, huge collector was always collecting multiple things. And, and I always loved her collection when I go collections, when I go to her house, I'd you know, want to look at all over. She had all this family silver. She had, she collected cookbooks and swizzle sticks and I mean, all kinds. And then everything from like Hummels and decorative plates and, you know, yearly ornaments. I mean, anything she collected so many things. And so I, I kind of had that instinct. I did right. that even as a child, I'd want to collect things. And so when I got married and I was looking at things for our apartment, I went to an antique store one day and I remember going in there kind of more out of curiosity and thinking like, well, I probably can't afford anything. My idea of antiques were these like really high end, um, you know, museum quality pieces. So I didn't think I'd be able to afford them. But as I was walking around in the antique shop, I realized like, wow, there's there's stuff in here I could afford. And I just had no idea. It was like this whole new world to me. And so I started buying, I bought a few Mason jars and a few little textiles, like this little baby bonnet and a few other little things. And that's kind of how it started. And then, um, I sort of honed what I wanted to buy after looking in more magazines and stuff. So one of the things I honed in on was Ironstone. Uh huh. Yes. And, And I definitely, I went through a period for a while where I wanted to buy as much as I could with my money. So it's like, if I could come out with a van load of stuff for $50, that was a huge win. And then slowly transitioned to, I'd rather buy just one thing that I'm so excited about than a whole bunch of other little things. So I had to kind of learn that lesson along the way. And, um, yeah, I started collecting ironstone about 20 years ago and oh, I found wow. my, yeah. You're like my, the original. <laughs> Everybody collects it now. <laughs> well, it was I remember seeing a feature, I think it was in Country Living or Country Home of someone who had an ironstone collection and I remember just loving it so much. I'd go back to that feature again and again uh-huh. and just like I love this stuff and I read about like how to tell what it is like you flick it and if it rings and it doesn't have any cracks okay. and all this stuff and um so I I spotted a piece when I was in a Florida antique mall with my mom and I'm like oh, I think that's it, that's it. I think that's that's a, that's a piece of iron stone <laughs> it was a very classic picture and I bought that I still have that picture and then just man it was like off to the races from there I <laughs> ironstone was my it's still I still love to collect it, but I'm to the point where like, I really, it's kind of a complete collection. Yeah. I, so say, I, I think, I yeah. Yeah. At some point you probably have a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'll only buy something if it's like really special or it's, you know, something that kind of fills a hole that I don't have. Um, cause I have, I, I don't even, I mean, it's probably at least a thousand pieces. So it's to the point. But it's where also it's, beautifully displayed. I feel like that is where some people might, you know, know like, okay, this is what's pretty, I should find it. But then like, where do you put it? Or like, what are some of the, I know you just, you do a lot of cabinets and built-ins and you, you put them in a, like a group, 
as well. Yeah. You know, it's not just like a random picture here or there. Yeah. Collections are going to have more impact when like things are together. So I try to keep my ironstone pieces all together in, in a collection, um, not all in one room because it's, it's too much, but I also use them all over the house. I have, so some are more display pieces, but I have a lot of pieces that I use. I mean, I use ironstone bowls for like my fruit bowls. I have seashells in them. I use pictures for my knitting needles. I put plants in little crocks yeah. and sugar bowls without the lids. I, we use ironstone for our daily plates and bowls and dishes and stuff. Um, so I, I use the pieces as well as have them displayed and they're all over. I don't care. Like if, I have ironstone plates in my bathroom and I do have people who say you shouldn't have plates in the bathroom. That's gross. And I'm like, well, we're decorative. <laughs> we're not like, I'm not eating dinner off of them and then right. putting them back in the bathroom. Um, they're just decorative and, yeah. and I, and I don't mind. I love ironstone. I hang it all over the walls. I put it all in every room and that's, and that's fine. So I think, um, with collections, like just, you know, love what you love and use it and have it out and, you know, definitely display it, but I'd encourage you to, to use it and interact with it too. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a big believer in that you don't want to have things that you can't interact with meaningfully. If you can't see them and appreciate them or use them and enjoy them, then it's, it's just stuff in a closet. It's there's uh -huh. just really right. not much of a point to it. So I'm pretty good about keeping my, you know, cabinets and closets and drawers kind of free and cleaned out so that they're not just stuff. Isn't just sitting in there. Cause I think that's kind of a waste of, of the stuff. Yeah. I definitely have that happening where I'll go antique shopping and I have plans for something and then it'll just pile up because we never get around to doing something with it. So I love that about something like Ironstone, you can take it home from the antique shop and incorporate it right where there's no like hanging necessary or, you know, you can use it and enjoy it right away. Unless of course you're putting it on a wall, but that's really easy. To oh hang. yeah. Yeah. Just a plate, <laughs> just a plate yeah. hanger and right. you're good to go. <laughs> yeah. So tell us a little bit about your book coming out in October. It's coming out mid October. Yeah. October 12th. It's okay. coming out. Um, it's called feels like home and it's really the story of this home, the suburban home that we moved into and adding character to it. But kind of the, while that's the personal story, the broader story is just about customizing your home and the things in your home and making it uniquely yours, making it fit your aesthetic and making it feel like a place that you want to live. And I think that especially during the pandemic and lockdowns and all of that stuff, I think there were a lot of people stuck in their homes who realized they don't love the way their home feels. It doesn't, mm -hmm. yeah. maybe it it's, there are things about it that aren't comfortable or practical, or there are things that they've been wanting to fix or repair or upgrade. And they just haven't had the time and, and, you know, they're busy with work and kids and all this other stuff. And I think that time where it's like, you just have to stop and stay at home for a while, I think gave us all the opportunity to either have a new appreciation for our homes or to say, man, there's, there's some things I'd like to take care of while I'm at yeah. home. And, um, I think it really started this broader conversation of, you know, what, what does home feel like? What do we want our how do we want to make our homes a sanctuary? And the book kind of it sprang from my own story of, of working on this home, but then also that kind of broader conversation that was going on through 2020. Right. Did you write a lot of the book during 2020? It was all like, written in 2020. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually, the, the book, um, like I started the book when we were still like under lockdown. And one of right. the issues was, I was like, I don't know if I can make the deadline. If I can't get out of my house to get materials, right. I, I don't, you know, or uh, are there going to be supply issues? Like there was, it was a big fat question mark when I was going into writing the book, but, um, I'm like, I, I think 
well, I'm just going to go for it. I'm just going to take it. I really wanted to work on it. I'm just going to take the step of faith. And, um, and it did work out. Things opened up um, enough so that we were able to, you know, do the projects we needed to do. And um, it, it was a really great project. The book was for 2020. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What a good, like, nice thing to be able to do while you're stuck in your home. So it's full of projects and then also tips, maybe some encouragement. You know, if you're, a lot of people are starting completely from scratch and that's where the the whole overwhelm thing comes in. And, you know, you just, you're looking at someone who's been working on your house for three years. Is that what you said? Three years? Four, four years. Yeah. Four years. Okay. Yeah. And it's beautiful, but you know, some people are like, I haven't ever done that. And so like, where can I start right now? And so you have a little bit of all of that. Oh yeah. There's tons of encouragement. I think there's a little bit of something for everyone, people who are like, okay, I'm going to give this decorating thing a try, but I'm not really creative. So we'll see. So oh, yeah, people there, are there's... always saying that. And I'm like, <laughs> I actually, I love the example of my sister. Like she's, she always says she's not creative. And then she starts this blog and her blog is doing great. And I'm like, you acted like you didn't know anything about photography or, you know, that you couldn't do it. She didn't know anything about it, but like everybody can sharpen that skill. Oh yeah. It's a, I had this conversation just with someone else on another podcast. Um, cause she had said, I'm not creative like you. And I'm like, Whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. Okay. We can't let this go. Let's talk right. about this because <laughs> I mean, there's a reason why there are art classes and photography workshops uh-huh. and pottery classes and all of that. If it was like a skill that you were just born with something you have, or you don't have, like if you have blue eyes or brown eyes, then you know, that you can't, you can't learn to change that, but you can learn art. And, um, oh, I'm just a huge advocate for you can learn. And, and I talk about that in the book actually, which it sounds kind of funny, but practicing decorating. And I did that for years, not realizing that's what I was doing, whether it was rearranging my dollhouse furniture or playing with stuff. And, I used to go shop at this, it was this wonderful little fabric store that they're, they're all closed now. Um, but they had this remnant bin where you could get dollar remnants. And so that that I just bought remnants. Like I didn't buy any amount of yardage that you could do anything meaningful with, but I bought all of these little remnants and I would spend a Saturday afternoon just like playing with my remnants. I wasn't making anything. I was just like, what patterns did I like together? What colors did I like together? And I kind of move things around and I still do that. I still love fabric samples and paint swatches and all sorts mm-hmm. of things. Cause I think it's really fun to, to play with those. And it kind of teaches you what does, what does your eye like? What are you drawn to? Is it neutrals? Is it, is it a specific color palette? Do you like brighter colors? Do you like um, fabrics that have a more modern feel or ones that have maybe a more traditional feel or more romantic. Do you like florals? Do you, you know, what do you like? And by working with physical things, it can really help you kind of find your style. Cause I think people get stuck with that. They're like, well, I don't know my style. Right. I'm not creative. And, um, everybody has a style. It may not be one that's like super trendy or like it's going to be in a magazine, but everybody has like comfortable and nice. I have a couple of sisters who are like that. They don't have like interest in, you know, like decorating as much, but they do have an interest in making their home a certain way. And it's, you know, it's just like comfortable, clean. You had a series and I, I, I don't know, is it still up? years ago where you went through the evolution of your house. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Is that one, one you want to keep buried? I loved it so no. much because you showed like just you working through figuring out your style for certain rooms until you had it. And it really showed the, the side of this is a practice thing that you work on over time. It's not just like, bam, everything I make is just like perfectly what I love from the beginning. Yeah. And I think that, that evolution series, it is still on my blog. If you just look up like like way long ago and I love it, (laughs) (laughs) but it was a very popular series because people loved seeing that it was this very slow process and also seeing 
how much the rooms changed over time yeah. and how like, Oh, I got, I got this wrong. Like, man, I don't know how many times I painted the master bedroom. I just really struggled with that room. And I kept, it was long. It was narrow. It was part of the addition. So it was put like in a weird place. It had one small window that was North face. It was just, it was just a really tough room. So I kept like trying to paint it a different color thinking that's, that that's just going to like fix it. And it, and it just never did. I eventually had to close off a doorway and kind of rework the room so that it had a better feel to it. But it, you know, I think that series did show just how it is a a process of trial Mm -hmm. and error. And I think with this house, so I have been, I just did one post on the evolution of the kitchen and I'm going to post some other, other rooms as well. Cause I, But I think with this home, you know, after having been doing this now for, I mean, I've been doing it as a hobby for 20 years and then as my business for like 12 years, I think I'm a bit more settled in, in what I like. Exactly. Yeah. You won't have those dramatic evolutions like you did when you were first, like, I think that original series was from like 20. I mean, it was like your beginnings of your first house, wasn't it? Yeah. And well, it was like, it. yeah, it was probably over a period of about 13 years. So, it, okay. and also I think it has a lot to do with my age. So it started at like, started when I was about 28 years old and then went yeah. up till I was almost 40. And so right. through that, that decade, I think I really started to kind of find my taste and my style yeah. and learn what I like and, and what I don't like. And And I will say photographing my home for the blog had a side effect of really being able to look at my home through a lens as opposed Uh to just through living in it every day. And that really did help me refine my style as well. So that's a, it's a great decorating tool. If you're not sure what you like or what you don't like about your room, just get your phone out, take some pictures of it and you're going to see it in the pictures, what you like Uh and what you don't like. It's for some reason, it makes it easier to, to kind of take it all in and see, you know, and make a judgment call about it. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much for all your expertise you share, you know, on here and then constantly on your Instagram and your blog. Is your book available for pre-order currently? It is. It's available okay. for pre- pre-order now and it'll be shipped October 12th. And we, I have all kinds oh of pre-order goodness. bonuses. So definitely okay. if you pre-order, make sure you visit my website and um, look and go to the, my book page and you'll see okay. just in the, the main navigation bonuses. there. I'll also be linking yep. it in the show notes in the description box. So I'm super excited to see it. And yeah, I know it'll be amazing. Yeah. I'm really proud of the book. I can't wait for people to have it. I've we've um, we have a launch team and we have some, so they're getting to see a digital copy of the book ahead of time. And we've just been getting really great feedback from people about, you know, how they feel encouraged and really excited and motivated to work on their spaces, which yeah, it'll be a perfect one to dig into as the weather gets colder and we know we're in our houses. We're kind of like, that's when it starts to really weigh on us. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Yep. I hope so. I think it's a good, it's a good gift book too. Cause it's, it's, while it's a beautiful decorating book, um, like you said, there's tons of encouragement in there. And, um, so I think it'll be a good gift as well with the holidays coming up. Oh yes. Perfect. Well, thanks again so much for joining me. Thank you, Lisa. It It was good to have a chat with you. All right. Well, make sure to head on over and grab a copy of Miss Mustard Seed's new book. If you go to her website, she also has some bonuses associated with it. So that is the way to order it. You can pre-order it right now. It'll be such a great book to carry you through the winter work on some things here and there, be encouraged and inspired. Also, you can follow along with her over on Instagram, at Miss Mustard Seed and her blog. All right, well, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Simple Farmhouse Life podcast, and I will see you in the next one.